This is my project studio. There are many like it, but this one is mine. There's not a lot going on in here, but it's still kind of a mess. It's a small room, and that's because it was converted from a garage just big enough to hold a single compact car. It's the first time I've ever had a dedicated space to make into a recording studio, and I am very grateful for it. The problem is that I didn't build the studio from scratch. I had some gear already, then when I got this space I put that gear in it, and then added other bits and pieces of gear as I went. As a result, there's no unifying philosophy, no central idea that the studio is based around. It's just a bunch of instruments and a pile of gear plugged into each other in a way that sort of works most of the time. I mean, there's an effort to keep it organized, but in terms of workflow, well, there really isn't any workflow. I'll explain why. When I started recording music, the prevailing paradigm was still very much magnetic tape. Some studios had started to integrate very early Pro Tools systems into their workflows, but if you were cutting any kind of record, there's a good chance you were doing it on tape. So the studios that I grew up admiring were the big professional setups with a huge console at the center, surrounded by banks of outboard racks. Even after computer recording became the standard, big studios still looked like that. And I only just realized that it was still the model that I looked to when thinking about my own gear. But the thing is, I've never owned a large professional studio. I've only ever had little project studios like this. So there's always been kind of a tension between what I grew up thinking I needed, which is a studio that looks like the bridge of the Starship Enterprise, and the reality that 100% of the work that I do is just me recording one thing at a time, usually into something like this Universal Audio Vault 476. We'll unbox this in a little bit, and you can skip ahead to that if you want. So I do have some rack gear, but nothing you'd envy me for. It's mostly random stuff that I've picked up here and there and then just put into a rack that I'm increasingly struggling to justify. And when I was recording audio for my last video, I had a look at the couple of units in there and I thought to myself, what are the chances I'll ever actually use this? And it's then that it dawned on me. It's all got to go. Here's my rack unit in all its extremely modest glory. From the bottom, we've got this Marshall SE100 power soak and load box. And it's not a bad unit for being around 30 years old. Being a load box, it shows your amp at a load so you don't need to plug a cab in, and it makes a line level signal for you to put through your IR. The cab emulation is also pretty decent, with options for open and closed cabs and mic angles. I do need a reactive load box, but there's no need for one to take up two units of rack space, when the two notes captor, for example, is a little box that sits on your desk. Next is a Korg DTR2 rack tuner. Again, nothing wrong with this unit, and it would work great in a stage rig for a touring band. You used to see these a lot sitting on the meter bridge of a big recording desk in professional studios, but I have about six different VSTs with tuners in them that work fine, if not better than this. Then we have a BBE 362 Sonic Maximizer. My understanding is that these were used extensively back when guitarists started using early digital rack gear that more or less destroyed your tone. The unit supposedly restores brightness by introducing harmonic content and low end punch by playing with phase. This might have been a good compromise back in the day, but these days when digital conversion is almost transparent, there's nothing this unit can do that doesn't make your guitar sound worse. Next is a patch bay. There are loads of different ways to use a patch bay, but long story short, you loop all your units into the back of it, and then you use patch cables in the front to chain up your units in whatever way and whatever order you want. Great if you want to insert something or if you want to build a chain. But if you don't have a bunch of units that you want to do that with, it's as good as garbage. Then we have an LA Audio dual or stereo compressor. This is what you might generously call a utility compressor, which is shorthand for not very good, but it'll do when you've used up all your good compressors. I don't know how many VST compressors I have, but I know for sure that most of them are better than this. And then we have this TL Audio 5051 channel strip, which is what you call a unit that has a mic preamp, a compressor, and an EQ in it. As with the LA Audio, I have a bunch of VSTs that do a better job of compression and EQ. The preamp is okay, but it's a valve preamp, and the 12AX7 in it runs too hot. 
I'll come back to my preamps. Lastly, this is a Focusrite Scarlett 18i20 multi-track interface. This would be a great unit for someone who wants to record a lot of sources at once, as it has all kinds of inputs, as well as multiple monitoring options. I bought this based on the philosophy that the more inputs, the better, but I rarely record more than two sources at once. Most of the preamps in this thing have literally never heard a signal. This is a Mackie Big Knob Studio Plus. I use it as a desktop monitor controller and headphone amp, and it's a two-track interface as well, so I could just use this and dispense with the Focusrite altogether. And I would do, but for three things. Firstly, it's just ugly. I mean, look at it. Secondly, it has a tendency to overheat. It's already been repaired once, and I don't trust it enough to have it as my only interface. Thirdly, it has way more functionality than I need, like talkback and inserts, and it can support three sets of monitors, as well as two headphones. This brings me to my monitoring. Maybe the nicest pieces of studio kit I own are these focal shape twins. They're very high quality near field monitors and they sound exceptional. Sometimes I feel like they're the only really wise and properly considered investment I've made in my studio equipment. And I do believe that your main monitors are the one area you shouldn't ever compromise on quality. Just think about how many thousands of hours you're gonna spend listening to them and how crucial they are to making sure your mix is good. You want to have made sure that you've got the very best you can afford. I don't think I'll ever get rid of these. I also have these vintage Sony speakers with this Sony solid state amp, which are my version of Yamaha NS10s. They have no bass extension and a very dull high end, so they kind of emulate listening to cheap commercial speakers in a suboptimal environment, and you can make sure everything is present in that narrow mid range. I've always kind of blindly bought into the notion that this was necessary, but after years of checking my mixes like this, I've decided that if you want to listen to my music on bad speakers, that's your problem, not mine. None of this stuff I'm getting rid of is what you'd call high-end gear, which makes this decision a lot easier. Obviously, if I had a rack full of vintage Fairchilds, I wouldn't be going down this road, but that's kind of the point. My experience is that outboard gear now needs to be of a very, very high quality to be worth giving it studio space instead of just using a plug-in. I probably won't ever own a vintage Fairchild, and most of you guys won't either. And I don't think I'll get much argument that you wouldn't be better off using a $40 Wave CLA-2A compressor emulation uh, rather than the $350 Clark Technic hardware compressor. I mean, no disrespect to Clark Technic, but unless you're doing the analog only thing on an incredibly tight budget, which is already a pretty crazy thing to do, I'm not really sure what the point of that unit is. To clarify though, I'm not saying that all outboard gear is now redundant. I'm saying that the guys who make studio software have now gotten so good at it, that in my humble little opinion, all but the best outboard is now redundant. But then the last time I checked, a Manly Massive Passive is six grand, so it's really up to you to decide whether you think that's worth the expense. Maybe the one exception here is mic preamps, because a VST can't make the physical changes to your mic input signal that a real preamp will. But the thing is, is that interfaces do have mic preamps in them, some of which are very, very good. Okay, they're not Neve 1073s, but just one of those costs two grand. The question is, how much do you need to spend to get a hardware unit that actually improves on what you're getting from, for example, the Universal Audio Vault 476? If you're interested in this interface, then please go ahead and click the link in the description. It's an affiliate link, so if you do buy it, I will get a small commission from the sale, which helps the channel. As this is my very first unboxing, we're going to start with a safety tip. A sharp knife is safer than a blunt knife. You want your knife to cut easily, because the more pressure you have to apply, the more likely you are to accidentally stab yourself. When you get a new piece of gear, you want to spend more time testing it out, and less time on your way to the emergency room. So be very careful. Universal Audio is a company with a cast iron reputation for quality, and although the Vault series is their range of affordable interfaces, I always feel safer buying from a company with a reputation to defend. Safety tip number two, when you're done with your knife or your scissors or whatever you're using, make them safe or put them away immediately. 
Inside all this very nice packaging, there is the interface itself held in place with two blocks of open self foam, as well as this box which contains all of the extra stuff. Here's the USB you'll need to connect the interface to your computer, which can also bus power the unit. If you want to mains power it, you get a power adapter with a bunch of international plug socket adapters. There's also this paperwork that nobody ever reads. It's a pretty streamlined unit with a very clear layout. To the left you've got your two main inputs, and to the right you've got the master section. Each input has a gain knob and switches for the vintage and 76 compressor functions. The knobs have a very positive feel with enough resistance to dial in precise levels. On the front of the unit, you've got two combination XLR TRS inputs and a headphone output with a volume knob. There's a master phantom power switch and each input has an instrument switch to select the correct impedance. These buttons feel very solid and well engineered. At the rear, you've got two line level inputs, your main monitor stereo outs and four line level outputs. You've got your MIDI in out and then you have the USB connections and the power section with an on off switch so you don't need to unplug anything. Out of the box, the unit feels very high quality with a decent amount of weight to it. Again, this is Universal Audio's affordable range, but the Volt 476 feels anything but cheap. The unit's unique features are first of all, the vintage switch, uh, which adds a bit of saturation and EQ designed to emulate the Universal Audio 610 microphone preamp. And then you have the 76 compressor, which is an 1176 type compressor uh, with three switchable presets for vocal, guitar, and a fast setting. Both of these functions have fixed parameters, but they will respond differently depending on the amount of input gain. Now, I've heard a couple of people sniff at these features, like, oh, if you're a serious recording engineer, then these won't interest you. But honestly, that's a bunch of nonsense. The one downside is that if you have them engaged, then that's the signal you're recording and you can't switch them off later. But that's true of any pre-input hardware signal chain as well. And it's up to you if they sound good or not. Of course, they won't work on everything, but that doesn't mean they won't work on anything. I think they're pretty cool features to include. A big part of the appeal for me is the unit's appearance. The aluminium casing with the wood shoulders gives it kind of a retro vibe, but what I like most is that it's got the feeling of a standalone unit. It's a very clear design statement, like this is the thing that's going to sit up on your desk and you plug everything into it and you don't need anything else. And that fits directly into the new approach that I've settled on for my studio. A couple of good connections, one set of monitors, and everything else in the box. And that's the last and one of the best features of this interface is that it comes bundled with some excellent VSTs. There's some classic amp emulations, some great compression, some reverbs and some delays, and even some auto tuning if you're into that. Now I had all of that anyway, but it's nice to know that if you're just starting out and putting your setup together, you're going to get a lot of help with your mixes. So of course, I didn't need the Universal Audio Vault to downsize my studio. I could have just cleared out a bunch of stuff and be done with it, and really any interface would have done. But when I had the idea, my first priority was to find a studio hub, something that does exactly what I need and nothing more, and well enough that I'll never wish that it was doing it better. It needed to work well, to sound good, to take up as little space as possible, and to look cool while doing so. And I think the Vault 476 does all of those things pretty neatly. So I guess I should round out the video with some aftershots of the studio. Not a lot has changed, but clearing out all the redundant stuff has made a massive difference to me. Of course, I have more physical space, which is nice, but I think the psychological impact of not being in a room full of junk I don't use can't be understated. When you're creating things, as much as it's healthy to not take yourself too seriously, you do need to take the work seriously. It turns out that's a lot easier to do when the tools you have around you are all things that you use all the time, every day. Thanks for watching my video. If you've enjoyed it, I would be very grateful if you would hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. And of course, I would love to hear your own thoughts down in the comments section. Thanks again. And next time, we'll be looking at how to become a shredding guitar god with the help of this bad boy. I hope to see you then.